The Mostly 3D Printed Speaker series is back for this video. While it's not as flashy as previous generations, it won't hesitate to perform just as good. It's a sleek design, while minimizing space is more of a bookshelf speaker. This little 3 inch driver will not disappoint, so let's jump right into the fun stuff. First up, a look at components internal to the speaker. The speaker is housed in a 4.1 liter vented enclosure with a down firing port. The box is constructed in two pieces to accommodate minimal support material when printed. The speaker utilizes the same two part design as previous versions, separating the motor from the moving parts. The motor is based around an N52 ring magnet. All parts were designed for easy printing, so the lower body is printed in two pieces and aligned with three 3mm three pegs. The motor utilizes mild steel laser cut plates, and the surround and spider are vacuum formed EVA foam and the cone and cap have been optimized for vacuum forming as well. The move to vacuum form parts has led to a drastic weight reduction with total moving parts weighing in at less than 5 grams. The coil and motor are part of an overhung alignment, so the coil is longer than the top plate is thick. All red printed parts are PLA and all yellow ones are PETG, and the enclosure is a silk PLA that has been Cerakoted. You'll see why that is in a moment. The box utilizes a shape that lets the sound waves roll around the box with sharp, without any sharp corners, and the bottom opening allows port waves to bounce down and out from the underside port. So let's look at why this box is Cerakoted, other than it looks and sounds really cool. It's due to a purge block being left on the printer and causing a blemish on the box. Normally I would just reprint, but at 800 grams, it was worth repairing since I didn't have enough left to reprint. I feel this is just to show not everything always works out, but sometimes we just gotta roll with what we have. Now vacuum forming. Oh, vacuum forming. Another tale of just running with it. I want to take back what I said about all the thermoplastics being able to be vacuum formable. TPU is a special case. I could not get a TPU printed sheet to be airtight enough to vacuum form. I tried on numerous occasions, and I failed on numerous occasions. I feel an extruded sheet would likely work, but not a printed sheet. At least not one printed at 0.32 or 0.64 millimeters thick. So one of the EVA foam had laying around, and I was shocked to find out you can, in fact, vacuum form EVA foam. However, the heat of the former changes the texture and feel slightly, so I now have an EVA foam surround and spider, which is a huge improvement over the TPU surrounds. I used the same method for my vacuum forming video to create model molds for all my parts and printed them all out of PETG. Moving on to things that went a little smoother. The motor was a big change for this version. Instead of the plates all floating and just staying in place via magnetic force, I opted to use jigs and epoxy filled with cardboard particles to hold the plates and magnets in place. This allowed for a much sleeker design and a simpler process at the cost of reusability of the components. The new coil winder worked flawlessly as well. It was as simple as entering parameters and hitting go. It allowed for a tightly wound coil at approximately 11.5 millimeters in height using 34 gauge magnet wire in a single layer. So now I'm changing up the order of my video, as I want to talk about the DATS graph in better detail for this video. We've all seen this graph, and I get it. Graphs are boring, and they remind us of the horrors that were math class. However, this graph is different. It tells a whole story about the speaker and how it's best utilized. First up, the Qs. QES, QMS, and QTS. First up is QES. This is how well damped the electrical system is, or essentially the motor is. A lower number is more damped, and a higher number is less damped and damping is a dissipation of energy over time. So the lower the number, the quicker the energy dissipates from the system, which means there is a sweet spot in the middle for speakers as they need to vibrate without losing energy instantly, but they can't vibrate forever either. QMS is the same concept, only applied to the mechanical system, which consists of the surround, the spider, the cone, and the air that it sits in. Again, larger number being vibrates longer, so another way to visualize the Q and damping relationship is a speaker submerged in water would have a small QMS number. As the water is harder to move, therefore dissipates the energy quickly, while putting the speaker in a vacuum would raise the QMS, as there would be less friction restricting the movement of the suspension and cone. Lastly, QTS is the combination of QMS and QES into a single figure. Using this formula on screen, we end up with QTS. From here, we get an overview of how the speaker would perform without ever listening to it. The same number and damping correlation applies here as well. So what is a high number and what is a low number? In the realm of speakers, a low number is any speaker with a QTS of 0.4 or lower, and a high number is a speaker with a QTS of 0.7 to 0.8. So ideally you want something in the 0.5 to 0.7 range. With that knowledge, let's take a look at the values of the graph. The QES is 1.64, and the QMS is 3.79, and the QTS is 1.148. This means ideally my speaker should be used in an infinite baffle or something like a door speaker in a car. 
To drop the QTS into the sweet spot, I would need to make the QMS dissipate energy at a higher rate. I could also make the QES smaller, but the QMS seems a more practical way to reduce the system overall. I hadn't discussed the Q factors in great detail on the channel yet, and I figured this would be very beneficial to the channel. As for the other parts of the graph, we have discussed them before. FS is just the resonant frequency of the system. It means very little considering it will change once in an enclosure. But in a free air system, this is where it wants to vibrate at naturally. The SPL is 79.35 decibels per watt at one meter of distance, which is fairly strong considering the three inch driver. For MMS, we have the moving mass, which like I said, it's on a super diet, sitting right under five grams. VAS is a weird measurement to me, but it is essentially the volume of air that has the same compliance as the suspension of the system. I know it's needed for proper enclosure construction and all that, but I'm unsure of the entire math that goes behind it. Lastly, we can see the blue spike in the graph is crossing into the red line, indicating this is a fairly strong motor setup. And now I've got that not math lesson out of the way. Let's do something fun and see the speaker play some music. I'll throw up a time lapse of the build as well, and I hope you guys enjoy that. However, I must first thank the video sponsor, PCBWay, for their continued support to the channel. If you want to build and design speakers like you see in the channel, but don't have access to the printers or metalworking tools, they are a cost-effective way to bring any and all DIY and professional projects together. They offer CNC, laser cutting, and 3D printing, along with custom PCB manufacturing, as you've seen in previous videos. So check them out at PCBWay.com and build your next project with precision. Now, back to the boring stuff. I do have a FEM picture, which is finite element magnet something. I'll put it up for the motor I designed this time. I was able to use FEM since I had a ring magnet in the motor as opposed to an array of magnets. So feel free to pause here and check it out. Moving from FEM into REW, now we can see the response curve of the near field capture. There's a nice downward trend from 120 hertz through the upper octaves that is interrupted by a bump from about 700 hertz to 4000 hertz. This hump could be smoothed out with a DSP and brought down to allow for a nice downward trend out into the upper frequencies. The rise from the lower frequencies to a peak of 120 hertz is very smooth, but I would look to cut it off around 75 to 80 hertz. Overall, for a 3 inch driver and a 4 liter box, this in my opinion is an acceptable response graph, and as you've heard, it's a decent full range, but could be accented nicely with a subwoofer and a tweeter. I'll quickly show the 45 degree near field as well as the far field, which is recorded in a room without any damping, so take that for as much as it's worth. From here, we can take a quick look at distortion and move on to the closing statements, so feel free to pause for the distortion. Overall, I'm very pleased with this project, as it brought along a ton of information regarding the speakers for the future. For one, I can use EVA foam that is vacuum formed. I also need to be careful with EVA foam though, as it does not offer much control of the damping of the system at all. 
I think I may try a pre-built foam surround in a future build, just to see how they perform. On the topic of damping, I believe that the mechanical damping is an area to focus on next time. The, the electrical damping was within my specs currently, so I'm quite happy with that. I do have a 3D printed subwoofer in the works. I cannot guarantee it will be in the next video, but it will release soon, as that was the requested project on the survey I released a few weeks back. So make sure you're subscribed and click the little bell so you know when that subwoofer video releases. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up, and thanks for watching.